are so appreciative of our mothers. And I want to say Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you. I'm glad that you have chosen to worship with, with us today. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 17. This is a message for moms, but we're all going to be able to glean something from it today. As you're turning there, I want to tell you that I am a people watcher. I like sitting on the outside and watching uh, watching how people react, and, and I know a few things about people, and I want to share some of the things that I've observed today, specifically about today's moms. And yes, I have observed today's moms. Is that creepy or what? I have seen moms frantically searching for their keys. It's in their purse usually or in their pocket, but they're always looking for their keys. But I've yet to find a mom who doesn't know where their teenage son is. They can always pinpoint exactly where their teenage child is because they have 15 tracking apps they've downloaded from youain'tfoolin'nobody.com. They're on her phone, her iPad, her laptop, the touchscreen car radio. She knows where you are at all times. I've come to realize that moms are a master of all forms of social media. They can even do amazing things on social media while walking and not looking where they're going. She knows the ins and the outs, the back door hacks, the secret keys, everything about social media. And she had to teach herself these things. And she learned them because she absolutely plans on stalking her children her friends, her, her child's friends, and her boyfriend, her girlfriend, and their classmates, she's going to keep up with what her child is doing. Even if she has to go to the dark web, she is going to find out what her child is doing. I've witnessed this in my personal life that when kids are small, she will read a bedtime story with passion and drama emphasizing every single word with theatrical inflection, perfect vocal clarity, and unmatched grammar and alliteration. But when her child is almost asleep or she grows tired of missing This Is Us, she will butcher that story. She will obliterate it, skipping dozens of pages, making up nonsensical sentences just to get to the end. I've even been to the outlets during school time, and I've seen moms there who secretly go into those fad stores to try on the clothes that their teenagers are wearing. Yes, I've watched you do this, and I saw the frustration on your face, and I followed you to Auntie Anne's Pretzel Shack or Starbucks Extra Grande Java, Java Chip Latte with extra everything in your, in your hands. I've seen that. I've also noticed... That the minute a mom today slams her child's bedroom door, she in anger will use the exact same words that sent her child to her bedroom, except with much more fervor. Today's mom insists on making her kids eat relatively healthy. I've seen this. I've seen this in my own family. But the minute her children go to bed. She will loot that pantry like a protester in Minneapolis. She is all over that thing. And she's not above drinking wine straight out of the, straight out of the measuring cup because that's the only thing that's left clean at the end of the day. I know that. Have you noticed that moms in this month, usually this time of the year, are making preparations to go to the beach and they get very frustrated because Target doesn't sell trendy one-piece swimsuits anymore. They'll tell you that. And she'll go on some ridiculous diet like eating kale and only kale for the month of May and then complain the whole first day of vacation that she looks like a Hulk in a onesie. Now, I get that. I hear that. But then she's over it. She's over it by the second day because every other mom's there trying to hide their weird color with an Alexander Wang Beach cover-up. I get it. I told you I watch stuff. I've noticed because I go to parks sometimes. I like parks. If you go to a park, you will see that moms today always cross their legs and bob their foot. They always do this. And I thought, well, that's a... That's a weird thing. Is that a nervous tick? What, what is that? I, I'm not sure. I did some research. I went to Piedmont Medical Center. They call this the MLT syndrome, maternal leg Tourette's. 
and I'm not sure what causes it, but I think it's allergies. It's allergies that cause them to cross their legs and bob their, bob their foot because when they're standing and they sneeze, they'll still cross their legs and I, don't, I guess it must be allergies. I've noticed that mom's bathroom visits directly correlate with a number of kids that she's had. A mother of one will visit a bathroom a little more often after they gave birth, but a mother of two, that will increase dramatically the frequency of those visits. A mother of three, well, she's never going to ride a roller coaster or jump on a trampoline again. And a mother of four or more... And let's face it, she's changing her diaper at the same rate as her babies. Some, not all moms, but some moms. I guess it just depends. <laughs> That's terrible. Sorry, sorry. As weird as they are, we've learned to, to lean on moms, to love moms. Not every mother's perfect, I know that. But those who try, we love you. And by association today, we're going to glean this message that I've written specifically for some moms. In in 1 Kings chapter 17, the prophet Elijah told King Ahab that God was not pleased with his sinful ruling habits. And Elijah said, it's not going to rain until I, I let it rain again. He was speaking on God's behalf. And of course, Ahab would have killed Elijah if he'd have got his hands on him and and tortured him and forced him to make it rain. So God moved Elijah to the east side of the Jordan to hide by a little creek. And once he got there, and I'm not making this up, it's what the Bible says. Once he got there, the ravens brought him bread and meat every single morning and every single evening. That is so weird. So you Christian Doomsday preppers, y'all need to relax a little bit. I mean, some finches might bring you some sunflower seeds or something when, you, when, when that happens. But he's at the brook, and of course it hadn't rained, so the brook does what brooks do without rain, dries up. And God again moved him to another place. And this is where we pick up in verse 8 of 1 Kings 17. Then the word came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a woman, a widow, was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may may drink. And as she was going to bring it, He called to her and said, Bring me a a morsel of bread in your hand. She said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm getting a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. And the jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that spoke, that he spoke by Elijah. Now notice some things about this woman. First, she's a widow. She's by herself in a society dominated by men, not very kind to widows at those days. But she was okay. In fact, she was probably a little better off than most widows. She had a house and a household and a son. So she was not completely poor, but she was in the situation that she was in. She was a mother. She had a son. She worked to provide for her son. Even to the last meal, she was providing for her son, picking up sticks in order to bake bread for their last meal. Notice that she was kind. 
She didn't know Elijah from Adam. She never saw this guy before. They're in a serious drought. She has one jar left of food, a little bit of water. He asks her for water, and she goes to get it. It's an amazing kindness that was shining in her. But she was desperate. I mean, she was desperate. There was this drought. There was no food. Her husband wasn't there to help her anymore. She had a house and a household to maintain. She was just a little bit stressed. She was absolutely desperate, and it made for desperate faith. She had a desperate faith. She did what Elijah said. She went and made bread for him out of the little bit they had left. That's crazy. She wanted it to be true. She wanted what he told her to be true. She needed it to be true for her family. And God blessed her. She and her household ate for a long time on that handful of flour and that few drops of oil. And the flour jar never emptied and the oil never dried up. Now look at verse 17. And after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. So her son gets ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring sin to my remembrance and cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up to the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the, from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the mother said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. Notice a few things else, a few other things about this woman. She was grieving for her son. She had, a, uh, she had lost a husband. Now she lost a son. And in her grief, like a lot of people, she spoke out of anger, even to Elijah. What have you against me, O man of God? She was questioning God's man. Why are you here? What did I ever do to you? And then she turned inward and she saw where she had failed in the past and she felt guilty about her past. That's why she said, have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and cause the death of my son? Like she would already seen this prophet do a miracle with the food. Now she was probably... Uh, a Baal worshiper, Baal worshiper. In this part of, of the country, everyone worshipped the false god Baal. So she was feeling a little guilty about that because she saw the miracle of the one true God with her food. And she thought that the initial saving of her and her household and her son was so that the death of her son could be so much more because she had such an evil past. She blamed herself. Funny how calamity will make us look at ourselves and blame ourselves like everything is our fault. But she was holding this child, probably rocking, grieving for her son, and this prophet says, give me the boy. Most mothers would not have done that. Don't you touch him, don't you touch him, this is my son, don't you touch him. But she gave him to the prophet. And the prophet took him away and took him upstairs and fixed him. God healed her son. He went up dead and he came back alive. She had true faith. 
What did she say? Now that I know, I, now I know you're, you're a, a man of God. God is real and he's in you. Now I know you speak God's word and God's word is true. I know that now. The word of the Lord in your mouth is true. She came to real, deep faith. Now I want to ask you a question about this passage. I want you to think about this. Why do you think this widow's name isn't mentioned in this passage? Think about that. A lot of, most stories, most stories in the Bible, God's, when he's telling a story, he's, he's telling the names of people there. He, we, we absolutely know there's credibility there because he lists their names. But in the story, he didn't list the widow's names. Why? At first I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's to keep the attention on what God is doing, on who God is and how he's blessing God's mercy and his grace. Maybe that. But the more I thought about it, the more I think that this woman's name's not listed because every single woman who will ever read this from now on will be able to identify in some way with this widow woman. Is there any woman in this room who can identify with trying to provide as best you can for your family? Sometimes without... A husband, sometimes without very little help from a husband? Is there any woman who can identify with your family being good and it seems happy at times, but it's very, very stressful? If people knew the stressful times, they would see your family different. Is there anyone who can identify with your family falling apart and there's absolutely nothing that you could do about it? You become desperate. For God's provision and his action. For some, your child is as good as gone. Living God knows where and doing God knows what. And you have the tendency to blame yourself. After all, you have a past too. And you're not perfect. And if you would admit it, you would say there are times when you get mad at God too. And you might even be a person of faith. You have a lot of faith. And you're kind. And you give. And you give. And now you're asking, why is this trouble on me? I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You've seen God move in your life before. But now you're asking, what in the world are you doing? What are you waiting on, God? Am I speaking to any moms here? Am I speaking to anyone here today? I have a feeling that I am. And I'm supposed to tell you today that you are not where you are by chance. You might think, how did I get to this point in my life? What did I do to get to this point in my life? I want to tell you, I'm supposed to tell you, you are not here by chance. You're not a parent by chance. Maybe by surprise, but not by chance. I like the New Living Translation of Proverbs 16. We may throw the dice, but the the Lord determines how they fall. Today, in in that context of future parenting, there's a whole lot of gambling going on right now. I know that. We better wake up, and especially if he allows a child to be born to you. That child is born for a reason. Psalm 139 tells us you were formed and you were... You formed me and my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In the book were written every one of them the days that you formed for me. When as yet there was none of them. God knew what he was doing by giving you that child. Even if that child was conceived in sin, he knew what he was doing. This is, by the way, is why we celebrate every child's birth in our church. There are a lot of churches that do not celebrate the birth of every child because of Um, the condition we find ourselves in this society. But we celebrate the birth of every child because it's a miracle child. God formed that child. Even if we disapprove of an unmarried couple's actions, we know that God made that child. You are not a parent 
by chance. And I'm supposed to tell you, you're not in your situation that you find yourself in by chance either, even if it's desperate. God knows it's hard for you sometimes. He knows exactly where you are right now mentally and emotionally. He knows that. He sees you. He hurts with you. And he knows exactly what you are feeling. Jesus knew what it was like to experience poverty, to be in want. Foxes have holes, birds have the air, uh, have, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That's what he said. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer from grief. His very best friend died, and he, his Bible says he wept. He knows what it is to lose someone. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. They all abandoned him in the garden. They ran away like cowards. Only John came to the crucifixion. Peter denied him. Jesus betrayed him. Jesus knows what it's like to experience sufferings. He suffered his whole ministry. I'd say he suffered his whole life. He was God in flesh. Dealing with brothers and sisters and a society that hated him. But he suffered at the end of his life like no other. With the beatings and the crucifixion. He knows what it's like to experience exhaustion. He walked everywhere he went. He didn't have a place to lay down. He carried his cross. He knows what it means to be tired. And he knows what it feels like to be forsaken by God. Some of you absolutely feel like you've been forsaken by God. And he knows how that feels. That's why he said on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God knows what you're going through. And as you suffer with him, he's suffering with you. It's not his plan. I mean, human sin nature brought humanity into these situations. But even in the middle of that, God put his own son right here in the middle of it to experience it with us. Why? To share in our sufferings. I can't believe that. God wants to share in our sufferings. The truth is... The hardships that we go through, the sufferings we go through, they benefit us. Listen to what your suffering accomplishes. One, it perfects you. James chapter 1 says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, or yours might say endurance. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It perfects you. Second, it connects you to God. It connects you to God, and to Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4, 11, it says, For we who live are, among, are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Suffering connects us to Christ because he suffered too. Listen to what suffering will never do. The hardship that you're in with your family and your kids, listen to what it will never do. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed. We're perplexed but not driven to despair. We're persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. You are not where you are right now by chance. God obviously is showing out in a way that we can't comprehend in your suffering. And he's going to receive glory for it. The second thing I'm supposed to tell you is God's blessed your life before. He can do it again. The truth is generous, faithful moms are blessed. They're going to be blessed. This mom in 1 Kings, she was generous, she was kind, she was faithful, and God blessed her. There's no reason to believe that God would treat you any differently. He will do the same for you. Proverbs 22, 9, there's a promise there. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Proverbs 28, 20, another promise. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but whoever hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Now, it won't be easy, 
There's some moms who try to uh, make an illusion that it is easy, and you know them. You, they, they document every part of their lives on Facebook, how awesome their kids are. Look what my husband did for me. My job's going great. Look at these beautiful plants, you know, on and on. Look at this meal, on. Everything's perfect. Somewhere I read that 90% of all Facebook posts are a lie. Parenting's hard work. It can be thankless, it can be frustrating, unenjoyable, sometimes it can even be soul-ripping. But God will bless those who are kind while being strict. And God will bless those who are givers while being good stewards of His resources. I mentioned soul-ripping. Sometimes, sometimes the decisions of our, of our children tear us apart inwardly. I know that. I, I felt that. Probably not as deep as a mother, but I, I felt that. I know that happens to us. It initially sends us to our beds. There's sometimes you're hurt so bad, you just go to your bedroom, you shut the door. But then you get to the point where it drives you to your knees. And God hears your prayers. Don't think He doesn't hear your prayers. He will act upon your request at just the right time. Look, Mom, I, I know some of you are grieving and you're suffering. I, I know that. I know that some of you have experienced that in the past. Grandma, I know that you experienced that too. And I don't, I don't know why. I, I, I can't tell you the, the ins and outs and explain to you all the philosophical reasons why God would allow this. But I do know this. Romans 8, 28 says, For those who love God, all things work together for the good. For those who are called according to His purpose, not just the good things, not just the fun things, all things work together for the good. If you love God, He can make everything that's happened in your family turn out to benefit you. Think about this. If the widow was not forced to grieve the death of her son, how would she have ever come to full faith in God? If she didn't have to endure all of that mess, how would she have known that God's word is true and real? The truth is, the suffering she had over her child benefited her. You have no idea what God is capable of doing. Our minds can't fathom what He is doing. He can fix this. He called you, He blessed you before, and He can do it again. The third thing I'm supposed to tell you is that true faith will sustain you. Mom, Psalm 55, 22 is applicable to you today. Cast your burden on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Mother might ask, this is pretty close to my heart. I'm wearing this real close. How am I supposed to cast this burden on Him? Well, I can tell you, just like every other burden... How to do that? First, you obey God. No matter what He says, you obey Him. You obey God. You, you can't see where you're going. You, you don't know what's out there. You don't know how He's going to turn this around. You might be wondering, how is He going to supply this need? How is He going to fix this kid? How can He save my marriage? Just obey God. Just keep going. You'll find out. Just keep going. Don't stop. Don't stall in your work, in your service to God. Obey God. You'll find out. That's the first way you cast your burden on Him. The second is give God everything you have. I know that you practice this, but as moms, you're nurture, you're, you're, you're the glue. You're, you're, you're the one that holds it all together. I get that. I know that. Nobody's too naive to say that. But you have to give God everything you have. You can get to the point where you actually start trusting in time away, at a, a vacation to, to heal your family. The problem is, is you come back home from vacation. 
And some of you, you, you trust that old car, it, you know, it's, it's got to get you to work, it's got to carpool your kids everywhere, and you're trusting in that, in that old car to, to hold it all together, but that car's eventually going to break down. And you keep your kids close, and you keep your wings over them, and you, 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 you try your hardest to corral them and keep them there, and, and maybe you ask for God's protection, but you're the, mur- you're the mother, and, and, and you hold them. But they have to go to school and they have to leave sometime. It's best just to give them to the Lord. I know you want to hold on, but you got to give them to Him. Give them everything that you're counting on. The third way that you cast your burdens on Him is to let God do His work. Let God do His work. Moms, you want to do that because you work on everything else in the house. You work on every relationship in the house. You work on every meal in the house. You work on all the chores in the house. You work on everything. You work keeping the schedule. You work getting the kids to places. I get it. But you need to let God do his work. The prophet took the son upstairs and fixed him. This is why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let God do it. Let go. Give them up. It's completely opposite your nature. Give them up. Because you don't have to do that corrective work, Mom. And you don't have to carry that burden, Mom. You can't stand under the weight and you were never meant to, Mom. Let God do His work. True faith will sustain you if you let him do that. I want to invite the musicians to come to the stage. And as they're coming, let me just ask moms. Mom, are you ready to give that burden that you can't fix over to the Lord? It is time today. It is time. You've held on to it way too long. And family member, are you ready to pray for her like you've never prayed for her before? It is time. She needs this now. I want to pray for the moms in the room. So I'm going to ask every mother in the room to please stand. I want to pray for you. You have have difficult times in your life, I know. And I I want to pray for you, and I want others to pray for you too but first I want you to pray for yourself so let's bow our heads and you just say a prayer similar to this to me in in your own mind God I will obey you I will give you everything I have I will let you do your work but you know how hard this is for me God to give these things up but I'm doing it today please take this from me And those of you who are sitting around that woman, would you just pray for her now? Pray the Lord sustains her. We got to have her. Pray that the Lord will keep her and bless her today. Pray that the pressures of life will, will roll off of her shoulders. Do that right now. Pray for her right now. Now let me say a prayer for moms in this room. Father, I ask that today you would bless the moms in this room. You would let them have a day of peace like we, we sang about earlier. Father, you would let her have a day of joy. Let her have just a minute where she can drop the pressures of mom today and just be your daughter. God, I ask that you would cause of faith in her to rise up to seek to obey you I pray you would give her the courage the boldness to turn over their family to you and I pray that you would give them patience to endure while you're working on their their house and their their family and their children and their spouse and their parents God turn this over Help them to turn this over today. And I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand now. Moms, thank you for what you do. We're going to thank...
thank the Lord for what he's going to do in your life. This is a, a powerful song, and, it, and I chose it specifically. Corey usually chooses all the songs, but today I asked him to play this one. We've sung it before. Because I know what God can do in your family and in your life. Please worship. Worship. Just let it all go today and worship. If you want prayer, Greg and I will be on the sides. We'll be glad to pray with you about anything, about letting it go. But in this moment, just let it all come off your shoulders and worship. God's got this. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you will move in us now in Christ's name.